Um, and I'll just give folks a couple minutes to take their seats, as it were. Cool. Awesome. Cool. Okay. Hi, folks. Here joining us for our event with Nick Green and M. Kutsi for Nick's How to Watch Basketball Like a Genius. You are in the right place. We're going to get started in a couple of minutes here. Let you folks take your seat. Uh, if you follow Nick on Twitter, you might have heard something about hors d'oeuvres. So I hope that you <laughs> prepared some for yourself. Uh, it's, a, it's a virtual pot. So I hope you brought some for everyone. <laughs> Hope you brought a hot dish to share. Yeah, um, enough cocktail weenies. Absolutely, <laughs> we need little smokies and uh, queso, perhaps. Mm. I don't know. Oh my gosh, good food. we need good game food. I think is what we need. We need uh, little smokies so... and queso. It's like all I eat. You know, <laughs> health of... nut. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Go really hard. It's the new cleanse in San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on a journey. I'm on a journey. <laughs> uh, while you folks are getting settled, I'm going to go ahead and tell you about a couple of events that we have coming up. Uh, first of all, hi, welcome. My name is Clara Johnson. I'm a bookseller here at Green Apple Books in San Francisco, which is where we are broadcasting from. Well, San Francisco, not Green Apple Books. Um, we do events like this all the time, and I'm happy to tell you about a couple that we have coming up. Uh, this coming Tuesday, I can't believe it is April already, but Tuesday, April 6th at 6 p.m. Pacific time, we're going to be joined by Sanjana Sethian, where she discusses her debut novel called Gold Diggers, highly anticipated debut novel, Gold Diggers. She'll be in conversation with uh, writer Pooja Bhatia. It's a, the novel is described as a magical realist coming of age story that takes place here in the Bay Area. So I'm pretty stoked about that. And uh, Celeste Ng says this about it. It's a dizzyingly original, fiercely funny, deeply wise novel about the seductive powers and dangers of borrowed ambition. Uh, we're really excited to also be partnering with the Ruby SF for this event. Again, that is Tuesday, April 6th at 6 p.m., the launch for San Jana's book. And then on Monday, April 12th at 6 p.m., we're really excited to welcome back our favorite and yours, Jeff Vandermeer. He's gonna be joining us once again uh, for the celebration of his latest novel, Hummingbird Salamander. He's gonna be in conversation with the very badass Beowulf translator, Maria Devana Headley. Uh, please do note that this is a take a date event. Uh, so we do have free event uh, admission only tickets available and we have plenty of them left. So do get them while you can. We also uh, have uh, tickets that come with event access, access to like an exclusive website where you can download like cool Vandermeerian art and Easter eggs about the book if you're like a total Vandermeer nerd like a lot of us are. Uh, and the ticket also comes with a signed copy of his new book. So you can find all of that info on our website. It's just greenapplebooks.com. And that is going to be Monday, April 12th at 6 p.m. Pacific time. We have a full event calendar on our website too. All of our events are free unless stated otherwise, like I just previously stated. That being said, if you can, please do buy books. Uh, if you've been here before, you will have heard me say that when you buy books, it not only supports us as a store and helps us put on events like these, but it also supports the authors who put so much time and so much work and so much blood, sweat and tears into making these books possible. And ultimately, you get a book out of it, which I think is pretty cool. So if you can, please do buy books. Please buy them from us. That would be stellar. All right. Uh, we do have a Q&A portion this evening. When you we have, uh, depending on your interface, it'll either be at the bottom of your screen or the top of your screen. It says Q&A. Uh, I will encourage you to use Q&A function for questions and use the chat function for chatting and saying nice things. Uh, if a question comes to you during the hour, we will get to them at the end, but don't let that thought escape you. Feel free to enter it into the Q&A and we will get to it later. All right, without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce the authors joining us this evening. First off, M. Kutsi is an artist, musician, bookseller, and poet living in San Francisco. 
They are the creator and curator of the Judah Chapbook Library. They're published in Red Light Lit, White Sag, Green Pop, Pathesis Northwest, and have been anthologized in the chapbook Bronze Chimes, Poems After Alfred Starr Hamilton. They were born and raised in the Bay Area and now reside in the fog of the sunset. Please welcome and Kupi. And last but not least, Nick Green is a contributing writer for Slate. Prior to that, he was editor at large at Mental Floss and the Village Voices web editor. Nick has written about trying to ride the entire New York subway system in one day, surviving the apocalypse without a spare set of contact lenses, and whether or not Elvis was actually any good at karate. We're gonna to have to talk about that later. He covers the NBA and NFL for Slate, has reviewed Guy Fieri's restaurant for The Voice, and took sh cold showers for a week for Men's Health Story. His book, How to Watch Basketball Like a Genius, is right here and is the reason that we are here this evening. Thank you so much for joining us, Pick Green. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, uh, Nick. It's really, I'm looking forward to hearing you read a little bit, read an excerpt before we get started. But first, uh, I wanted to say thank you for um, sitting down with us. Uh, reading your book is really, really interesting. And I have a bunch of questions. Um, but yeah, uh, let's, uh, I know we were thinking about doing an excerpt reading. So sure. let's, let's start there. Um, love to hear what you chose. Yeah, oh, great. Um, this is, um, you know, one of the things that fascinates me about basketball is the fact that it's the only major sport that can be traced to a single inventor. Um, you know, you think about baseball, football, um, hockey, those are all games that have evolved from various folk traditions, yet there was a guy named James Naismith who came up with basketball one day, um, which I just find extremely interesting. And uh, in the beginning of the book, I, I write about the, the first basketball game ever played and, and, and kind of dive a little bit into Naismith the man. So this excerpt is, is about Naismith. Um, I should note it's only about five minutes. I know that I sometimes get anxious at readings when I don't know how long the excerpts take. So this is five minutes, I think. Um, don't hold me to it. Uh, I, I, I chat at different speeds when I'm timing myself maybe, but all right. <clears throat> Naismith will slowly fade in the rear view as we venture beyond the environs of the Springfield YMCA. This is a shame as I've grown rather fond of him. He was a delightfully odd man, the kind of sweet eccentric who brought his dog along with him on his honeymoon. The honeymoon took place aboard a 22-foot boat, and both wife and dog were seasick for the entire trip. Here's another example of just how weird James Naismith was. Despite inventing basketball, he only played the sport two times in his entire life. His team in one of those games, the YMCA teachers, lost 5-1. to one. Their lone basket came from Naismith's friend, A.A. A. Stagg, a man who would go on to become a pioneer of American football. Naismith and his wife, Maude, invented an early flannel version of the football helmet. It was an attempt to prevent cauliflower ear, an ailment Naismith picked up while playing center for the YMCA training school's gridiron squad. When the University of Kansas was looking for a director for its physical education department in 1898, Stagg suggested Naismith, whom he described as, quote, the inventor of basketball, medical doctor, Presbyterian minister, teetotaler, all-around athlete, non-smoker, and owner of a vo vocabulary without cuss words. Naismith also agreed to coach the University of Kansas basketball team, even though he thought players should be left to their own devices while on the court. He called coaches who micromanaged evil, and he more or less allowed his team to do as they pleased. He refereed many of his own team's games during those early years and was unflinchingly fair. Kansas lost a good number of these self-officiated contests, including the university's first ever game, a 16-5 defeat to the Kansas City YMCA. Their opponents played rough, but when Naismith called fouls on them, the young men from Kansas City told him he was mistaken and then kept on playing without punishment. In his final year as a head coach, an article in the University Daily Kansas questioned his commitment to success. Quote, Dr. James Naismith, the inventor of the game, is so busy with his work as athletic director that he rarely finds time to give the men a thorough training. He never thought winning was all that important, and his record during his nine-season run as Kansas's head coach reflected this. 55 wins, 60 losses. Kansas became a basketball powerhouse soon after Naismith stepped away from the sidelines. According to Rob Rain's biography of Naismith, he spent his post-coaching years teaching and working on medical experiments. These included a sobriety tester and a proprietary method for determining whether or not someone was a natural athlete. 
According to a former student, Naismith blindfolded his subjects, clogged their ears, and put them behind the wheel of a car. If they could sustain a, sustain a speed of 35 miles per hour, that meant they had great kinesthetic sense. Read into this what you will, but Naismith himself was a terrible driver, with or without the blindfold. Naismith also invented a, med a medieval rack-like machine that he believed would make people taller. He told the school newspaper that babies between the ages of five months and one year should be stretched on the device. His only concern, he said, was that the children may never stop growing. Unlike his baby torturing machine, basketball actually works. It's a stupendous invention, though it didn't gain him ubiqu ubiquitous recognition as a household name. Once, when visiting his son in Iowa, Naismith popped into a gym at Morningside College to watch a pickup game. The boys needed a referee, and one suggested the quiet, bespectacled man with the center part for the job. Come on, that old duffer never saw a game of basketball, exclaimed another student. Naismith found the ordeal hilarious. Nearly a, nearly a decade after Naismith's death, his daughter wrote, a, wrote to legendary Kansas basketball coach and Naismith protege Fogg Allen to complain about the glaring lack of recognition on campus for her father. There wasn't so much as a plaque to commemorate his accomplishments. Allen wrote back that he had suggested dedicating the new stadium to her father, but the idea was rejected by university officials. After a few years later, Allen Fieldhouse, named for Fogg, opened to great fanfare. A tough break, but I don't, I don't think Naismith would have been too bothered by it. Going by his own words, there is no place in basketball for the egotist. Hope that was five minutes. <laughs> oh no, that was, uh, that was great. What a great place to start too. Um, I, I love the way that you wrote about him as kind of, a, he became as I was like reading what you wrote about him, kind of this like lore filled, like kind of mythical figure. I kept thinking about him as this like historical and, and it just got more and more interesting. You did a great job at making him such like an interesting case as like kind of the inventor and- uh, Well, uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, is that where this like, and it made me think, is that where like the genesis of this book started was kind of like an interest in him or what What was the genesis of this book? No, that was a, a happy accident really. Um, the genesis for this book was, was um, basically wanting to talk to interesting people about basketball um, and learn about the game from sort of surprising and maybe unsuspected and unsuspecting uh, sources. Um, Mainly because I, I find myself, you know, I, I don't only write about basketball, I write or try to write about a lot of things. And I always find myself sort of having small talk about basketball with people, you know, other subjects or other interesting um, folks who I, I wind up talking to. And, and I thought, well, I, I can still learn a lot about the game because we all watch it differently. We all, you know, it's, we all bring our own sort of sets of, of uh, expertise and, and, um, proclivities to our watching experience. And, and so I thought, well, that'd be a fun way to explore the game. And, and I sort of, uh, you know, just by starting back from the beginning, I, 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 the more I read about Naismith, the more interesting and, and kind of a humorous uh, character uh, in the whole scheme of things he was. I mean, he's a mythical figure now, as, as you mentioned, but, um, uh, you know, during his lifetime, he was pretty forgotten. Um, no one really listened to him when the game was changing and evolving. Uh, you know, he had suggestions that always were uh, more or less ignored by the powers that be. Um, but, um, you know, he, he think it, the fact is he's probably responsible for the one of the most in, uh, successful inventions in the history of the Western Hemisphere. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I Absolutely. Um, you know, I also, that was another thing, I, I, another feeling I had reading this was that I, I felt like you really loved basketball, like that, it felt like it yeah. was getting out into so many different areas of life. You did a great job at talking to different people about it and bringing in this, just like so many different perspectives of, I mean, um, you were talking to designers and um, physicists and ballet instructors. I mean, there's so, there's such an interesting, um, experience and kind of myriad experience that you're like pulling from and and I was I was like looking at the title and I was like this could have been like how to watch basketball like like you're in love with it or something like that it would <laughs> feel like this like was like a passion uh project that almost like inescapable I yeah I do I adore basketball and and that's another sort of part of the attraction and and, and idea for the book too is is I've never really ran into anyone who just said I hate basketball Sure, there are people who, who hate the NBA, but oh, I like college, or you know, I, I, um, 
different aspects of it, but, but basketball has a pretty, I guess, high Q score is what they say. It's, it's, it's pretty universally beloved. I'd say, um, you know, it's, it's something that anyone can pick up and play. You don't have to be good at it. Everyone's shot hoops in an empty gym, pretty much. It's, it's, it's very accessible and fun and, and, and kind of being in love with a game. I, I, it, it was, um, a real treat to talk to other people and sort of, um, get to hear their experiences, you know, similar experiences as mine. Yeah, absolutely. Um, with that, like, I, was there, was there one of, I mean, it feels like every kind of conversation you had in this book with, with these different people kind of contributed to, um, like this greater understanding of the game, but was there one that stood out to you as, as being like, that, that you went home after speaking to one of these people and you really like watched the game differently with like a different um, like set of, I don't know, different perspective. Um, yeah, they all helped, you know, a great deal with that. One I thought was, was particularly, um, I think interesting and, 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 and really gave me a lot to chew on was with the um, uh, artistic director for the Oakland Ballet Company. Um, and he was fascinating because I had, you know, assumed a ballet choreographer and a, you know, professional dancer as himself would, would hot, would hold ballet and ballet dancers, um, sort of their, uh, skills and, and, and higher regard than basketball, which is just a game. And, and he was, you know, <laughs> he was very blunt and was just kind of more impressed by basketball players than, you know, than any dancers he's seen he was blown away um you know in awe of of the beauty and the sort of the um grace of of, of a nba players movements uh because he his company would do um a, a portion of the nutcracker suite during halftime at, at warriors games uh during christmas and so he would get to see it up close and he was relaying that experience and i thought that was just so cool to have someone who has such a um uh i, I guess a terrific understanding and appreciation for for moments of physical beauty to look at the game that you know I love and we all play and enjoy and and, and have fun with and, and to hold it in such reverence is uh was was pretty cool I think yeah no that that is beautiful because I I mean I can relate as it's like a layman and not someone not um, in touch with any type of physical competition oh, or physicality at that level. Me neither. Yeah. Uh, watching these guys play, I mean, um, watching the athleticism of some of them, or um, you know, even just like the endurance. Uh, there are moments when I'm struck at, uh, struck by either some sort of feat, like watching Russell Westbrook during his MVP year was unbelievable was watching mm -hmm. just like the motor that everybody talks about in him or, or watching Steph run off ball um watching like Steph Curry just like run for an entire game just like pushing <laughs> his way through defenders um and then sometimes too what they say I love in, in in this book there's this great quote that you gave of Clay Thompson's which like struck me um which I thought was so beautiful and when you were talking about his shooting form he's like imagine a reverse waterfall like starting at your feet and coming up through your body um, to the point of release. And that was such a poetic and beautiful moment. And anybody who knows Clay, yeah. watches, <laughs> this, is like, this guy, Clay Thompson is just like, he's such, you know, he's such a chill dude. But, but to hear him say that, I was like shocked and, um, or, or to read that, that anyway, I was like shocked. And it was just like this really beautiful moment. And um, this, this like philosophy of, of being embodied, of being embodied, of being being in your body and being this physical thing and just like letting it speak for itself and to be kind of like in this moment. I don't know, it's, it's really, really beautiful. Yeah, it's it's Clay Thompson, who's, yeah, as you mentioned, just like the most chill, laid back dude uh, in the NBA. And all of a sudden he's speaking in sonnets, practically. It's it's pretty awesome. And and I, I it's the it's kind of thing is, is you know, I, I if you ever get a chance to, see high level basketball in person. I, yeah. I, 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 it's, 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 it's pretty incredible. I like it. It's, it's almost like, um, you know, hearing someone with a really beautiful voice sing in person is, uh, very hard to sort of explain and articulate, um, the majesty and, 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 and everything about it. You can hear them on a, a you know, a CD or a CD. Yeah. On the, on the old uh, gramophone, uh, it sounds good, but in person, there's a, there's an extra sort of, um, layer of, of, I don't even know what to, to call it. That's, that's worth, uh, um, checking out. 
Yeah. Do, is there any moment, like I was going to ask this question later, but I think this is a good time. Is there any moment when um, something happens like on the court when you're experiencing, experiencing the game? And I, I know each people um, or each, each person kind of uh, has a different appreciation either for their own team or, or whatever. And some people love it when like they watch LeBron pass. Some people like live for Steph three. Some people live for fourth quarter Damian Lillard. Like, I mm -hmm. mean, I think there are these like activating um, moments or act moments in different players narratives that are activating to a, to a viewer to a fan um like what are what are your some of the things that like really like activate you as a fan and as a lover of the game gosh you know i um something that surprised me that i i, I enjoy so much are the really deep three pointers that as, as someone who kind of considers himself to be a little more old school and, uh, you know, oh, I miss the 90s and, and when the game was played more inside and more post-ups. Um, I When Steph or, or, or Damian Lillard pull up from the logo, um, it, there's there's the there's a not insignificant amount of time the ball is in the air that allows you to think about it and um, allows you to sort of uh, trace the parabola um, uh, with your eye and, and just knowing that this is there's a really good chance this is going in and then having it go in is is uh is a pretty it's 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 funny what it i mean those experiences like you can't help but laugh it's a it's a it's like a joke and it's it's a, a very well told joke that happens when those two players play yeah i mean i'm they're, they're amazing i think i think one of my favorite things to watch was actually sean livingston pull up and just do a, like a turnaround a little mid-range yeah. like a cute little mid-range like that was so satisfying to me as like a viewer, um, maybe because it was so consistent. Maybe we all see consistency uh, in, in some way um, and or or we appreciate it in sports uh, because of its chaotic nature. Like, I don't know, but watching Sean Livingston play was just like such a treat to me. I, I enjoyed that as well. I think because when he's playing with, you know, Clay and Steph and and they're obviously the best long range shooters in the history of the game. And, and he's sort of working on the inside and and kind of making his hay down there in the in the in the in-betweens it provided a nice um aesthetic contrast i think yeah absolutely um i i actually wanted to talk about some of the i mean you explore the change of the game a lot um in your book and like kind of like the evolution of it and and i felt like i could track myself as i was reading through it like I could track the different changes in some ways. And, and I mean, you talked about how dribbling what was created, which was like fantastic. It was such <laughs> a great little anecdote. Um, and then the creation of the three point line, defensive three second violations, the invention of the shot clock, all of these things that have come to really define uh, what we know as um, basketball today. Um, and how important was that for you? How important was that to, you know, in, in writing this, like what, yeah. Again, I think, again, going back to the fact that this is it's a relatively recent invention, um, and we can track those changes. Um, we can see why they occurred, who made them, uh, what the point the point of them were. Um, so I feel like it was a, a, a unique opportunity, really, to um, to basically because I mean, so much of, of the conversation around basketball is. is a, about generational contrast and and how things are different now from back then and you know old old timers love to say the game was tougher in their day and 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 whatnot and and, and it, it feels like the fact that we can not just sort of say that to say that and 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 kind of assume that things are different but to really understand why they are and again it, it, as always with basketball it goes back to Naismith and and he was sort of adamant about the changes that occur should be for um, the spectator. I mean, even though he he invented the game for students to keep them busy on a snow day, um, he always thought it was had to be. It was essential that the game would be fun to watch. Um, and so you you that sort of uh, helps when you go back and look and, and and think of all these changes and and wonder did this make it more fun to watch? That's a big thing with the three point line now. There's so many three pointers. It's that's the, the 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 question of the NBA in the last ten years is 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 this more fun to watch? And it's not a sort of yes or no binary kind of question you can answer. You kind of have to watch and and see. Yeah, absolutely. Let's say okay. Let's say you became like basketball dictator right now. Like you were writing a presidential 
you know, executive order on basketball right now, if you could make a change, even like for fun, this was just, even if it was like for 10 days, for 10 games, like what would you, <laughs> I'm actually curious on like what change you would make or would you, yeah. I would, I would, uh, uh, well, I'd make I'd, I'd make the Chicago Bulls sign me, and I'd make a rule that says I, I no one can touch me or be a foul. Um, and uh, even my misses were makes. That would be my first uh, order of business. Um, and my second order of business would be, gosh, you know, again, because the the big question is 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 around the three point line. There's a I I spoke with um this guy named Kurt Goldsberry who's a cartographer you know, in by training and trade, he's a big basketball figure. Now he works for teams and, and he, he writes about basketball too. Um, and he um, was sort of in mapping the basketball court and where people are taking shots. He was one of the first people to realize, oh gosh, when people, you know, there are going to be too many three pointers soon. Um, you know, I, I think that I like the three pointer. I think there's probably, there probably are too many as, as he points out um, a world with more three pointers is a world with more misses because that's just their lower percentage shot. So um, even, you know, Steph Curry misses 60% of his threes. Uh, and his idea was to every season move the three point line to the corresponding place on the floor where the incentive of having one more point would mathematically make sense um, where it actually was. Um, gosh, I, I, math is not my strong suit. I, that's why I talk to people who do know math because they can do this for, for me. But wherever it is, is would it be 33.3% more difficult to add one more point? Is that how it works? Anyway, wherever shots are, in fact, that much more difficult, that's where the three-point line should be. And it's a kind of change that you could never do until recently when you had the technology to sort of, you know, com collect and combine all these shots and look at them and, and, and um, uh, you have, you know, sports track, you have tracking of, of players and whatnot. So I think that would be, it's, it's interesting to, to see a, a fluid line every season would change and how that would change the game and, and how players would respond. And I think now he said that if the, the, the line would be about a foot further out, maybe um, a little less than that, I forget, but um, it'd be interesting. And then the fact that it would change every year would force people to sort of adjust. Yeah, I think, I think that would be, uh, really interesting and I, th I think that some of the I think one of the points uh, or at least that I took when reading your book was that like that um, forceful adjustment kind of the the adjustment to these like new and changing rules are what created some of the most um, I don't know iconic players that that we know it created yeah. like stylistically or um, kind of like huge movements and different eras of basketball were created by these um, by these uh, different um, by these different rule changes and it the, rever the, the reverse is true i mean the, the players themselves when they get to be so dominant the rules have to be changed for them wilt chamberlain george mike and, and honestly steph curry is is such an influential player it's almost only appropriate that there be a rule change for him because you know it's, it can't just be the big guys who uh, are forced to um <laughs> play to everyone else's uh rules yeah yeah that's really interesting I I know you're I, I, I was thinking about like the role of the big man a lot and like how it's changed and like this I feel like your book did a really great job of kind of presenting the evolution of, of that and like utility and like what we become uh, or what people become in their professions and their jobs as things change yeah. as things change like this was like um, you know it, you did pull so much more than just basketball into this which made it which made it really beautiful. I was even thinking like reading this, I was thinking about like evolution too and like how, how we evolve just like, you know, um, here as, as people and as society. Um, totally. And, and uh, yeah, and like our economics too. I know that you said something about Nay Smith was like, was he, um, uh, he was kind of like anti-money. Uh, oh sense. yeah. He, he, like, he was like a huge anti kind of capitalist or the infusion of that into the sport. He, he detested the idea of, money bleeding into the game um especially because at the time it, it, this was pre-professional so it was the college game um which obviously is you know is, is is still a little bit of an issue um uh but he wrote a <laughs> an essay in a magazine basically just about how awful it was that money was coming into the sport and, and into college athletics and how evil it was um and uh which is you know pretty righteous i mean he he didn't he didn't make a penny off of basketball. He could have copyrighted it. He could have 
you know, clamp down on it. But basically his, you know, his most important contribution wasn't the rules. It was basically his um, laissez-faire attitude and, 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 and willingness to let, let the game evolve on its own, um, which I think is, uh, you know, there's gotta be a lesson in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was actually really, I didn't know that, like, I mean, he talked about like, um, um, like women playing basketball in the late 1800s. It was like 1890s. Like he, like there were women playing basketball, which I know like sports have been so divided uh, along a gender line for so long. Um, and, you know, it made me really think about um, the, what's happening like the disparity and the discrepancy in, in, in money right now between the NBA and the WNBA. Yep. Um, and I was thinking about that a, a, a lot. Um, and it, you know, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm very, I, I think the, M, the WNBA needs more money. I think they need more mm -hmm. infrastructure. I think um, all of that definitely needs to happen. But, and why do you think there's still like, why do you think there's such huge, like women have been in, like so important um, and essential yeah. to this game? you know and building it um one of the first as you mentioned one of the first games ever played was um when Naismith invited a nearby uh girls school um over because some teachers were walking by and were curious about what they were playing and and they asked if they could join and he said of course and this was before you know young women were allowed to play team sports um and and as the decades went on he wound up preferring the women's games he he watched because he thought that they were um improving uh their technical ab abilities at a, at a steadier pace and they thought their profession proficiency was was sort of matched uh what you know the progress he had envisioned um and i think yeah i, I you look at um the fact that the the ncaa uh refuses to call the women's tournament march madness as part of their copyright which is ridiculous i mean it's i think when you look at it like it some of the biggest women's basketball fans are NBA players. If you, anytime there's a really good game going on in the WNBA or women's college basketball, check out the feeds of NBA players and they're all riveted and getting their two cents in because they know, they know it's good. They know it's legit. Um, and, you know, I think it's probably the, the, the same stupid bullshit, uh, you know, that, is cause for a lot of problems along uh, those lines, but yeah, it's, it's luckily um, it's a, a thing that we can individually just turn it on and watch for yourself and see how good it is. And, and uh, the, the, the um, gosh, was it the Michigan Baylor game that was uh, over the weekend um, in the women's tournament was one of the best games I've, I've seen all year. Uh, it was the shot making was remarkable. And, and it, there's a point where if uh you know, people don't want to watch that or the NCAA doesn't want to promote that. I mean, that's, that's on them. They're just being stupid. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I, as a viewer, I'm, I'm, I think I'm like disappointed in the visibility of that in a general sense. And I know that like, um, there is like a love for the WNBA and women's basketball, uh, for sure. Uh, even among, you know, players in the NBA and, and among basketball heads, absolutely. Um, and a lot of respect. Um, and that's actually one of the reasons I think the NBA has done a, you know, for all of its faults, um, it's done a pretty good job at taking a political space um, in the last, you know, 10 or 15 years, I feel like, um, and longer than that. I mean, you know, we, there were, I mean, there have been people not standing for the anthem in, in basketball since the 90s and even like earlier. And I know there have been suspensions around it, but mm -hmm. um, basketball has, you know, I think they've done, I think the NBA too has allowed players to express themselves in a certain way. Um, yeah, I think as like a viewer, I mean, it, it makes it realer to me. It makes me feel more connected um, to the players and people. Um, I, I do. I do think that that, you know, all credit for sort of um, stances taken on social issues and, and social progress in the NBA. I mean, all credit should go to the players because the reason that, you know, you know, and they still have a lot of work to do as a as the NBA itself does. But the reason for any of that happening is because the players themselves and they're the ones who, and I think, I think in the, in basketball, in the NBA, it seems more evident and, and obvious to us just because the players have more power, they're more at the forefront um, for a whole host of reasons. So yeah, they're, they're the ones I think who deserve all the credit and, and the NBA when it is uh, acting uh, wisely and smart are kind of just follow their lead. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 
completely agree. Um, and and I and I think that I really hope that yeah I don't know. Um, I really hope that like sports doesn't have to be. A, I know there are a lot of people I know in my community that that don't enjoy watching sports or have some sort of a you know connotation with them of like oh they you know don't care about this or they're hyper capitalist and social issues to them are kind of like this um this you know it's kind of like a smoke and mirrors thing they make so much money like and there are people you know dealing with like these really intense like hardships everywhere and we're talking about you know 30 50 60 million dollars for like a player a single contract i mean the amount of money involved is is i think enough to um make reasonable people not want to engage in it um mm -hmm. That, I mean, what we, yeah. we can tell them is that that the, the money that the players don't get then goes to the owners. I mean, it's <laughs> it's yeah. There's there's a the, the money is, is crazy, but uh, it's it's about the you know where that goes and and it's because you know they got a union. The players have a union. It it, it, it makes a difference. It yeah. helps. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and as a viewer too, I, I think there's something special about watching basketball it happens to be and not just basketball like there are team sports in general um uh, watching chemistry between people watching the beauty and fluid the fluidity of like their movements or um their communications whether it be verbal or nonverbal. um and then even to be sitting in an arena like you said and have like thousands of people all kind of engaged in this like strange form of like mass hysteria all focused on like a single object um and i don't really think there's anything else like that not really yeah not at like concerts, not at anything. There is a sort of special thing that happens where everybody is focused and kind of like on one single thing. And like, what is that one object gonna do? And I think there's something powerful in that and strange. Yeah. I think I think basketball has a, a tremendous advantage um, along with soccer of, of just being simple. Um, you can sit down uh, and, and, and watch a game and have no idea about how the sport is played. And, and you could pick up a lot of it you know, in, a, in, in 10 minutes or so, you take something like football or baseball, uh, it's, it's astoundingly uh, difficult to, to comprehend. And uh, something that is a, a lifelong sports watcher, I'm still sometimes struggle to, uh, to fully grasp what the hell is going on in, in a baseball or a football game sometimes. But yeah, it's, again, an, an, another lesson for, for, for people making stuff out there is, is keep it simple. <laughs> <laughs> it can't hurt <laughs> yeah no that's that's great Did, was there anything that um was there was there anything that uh after you finished this book that you wish you would put in it was that's a anything? good yeah that's a really good question um I managed to put a little bit about the the covid bubble uh in it in in the in the epilogue um but I think just that entire situation was so fascinating and it was an ability to watch basketball in a bubble. I mean, away from live fans. And uh, there's so many, I mean, as a sort of science experiment, um, fascinating things to learn and, 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 and whatnot to, and, and while observing that. So it would have been fun to have a little more time to really dive into that. But um, uh, and, and, and who, you know, who could I talk to who would know about, that kind of uh, solitude. I don't know, deep sea divers. Uh, who else uh, <laughs> knows about being alone and, and isolated like that? But it, it's uh, that's something I think would have been fun to to explore. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, I I've heard this really. Was it like uh, Jimmy Butler started his own coffee company? Yeah, Big Face Coffee. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> he brought he brought a French press, uh, and so he was making really good strong coffee and. And all the other players wanted it, and so he's charging twenty dollars a cup. Uh, <laughs> not, not a bad, not a bad move. Not he he bad knew bad. he knew they had it. You know, he was yeah. he had a cap he had a he had a captive audience, a captive uh, consumer. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's great. Um, well, thank you so much. Uh, I I really appreciate uh, you sh sharing this uh, with me. Do should we should we ask for questions yet? Or are we? Do we still have time? Where where are we? We good? You can certainly, if you have um, another question, you're you're welcome to. We do have one in the Q and A, and I have some of my own. So yeah, up, you up to you all. Okay. Um, I let me 
let's let's do the question now we can ask a couple questions and let me come back because i do have but they're kind of like fun and i don't know let's focus yeah let's do this yeah sure um this one is from stephanie hi stephanie how has coaching evolved um do the it's a couple questions do the coaches adapt to the players players adapt to the coaches particularly with how quickly the game has changed since so many coaches last played yeah that's excellent question a great question um and it's funny i i talk a little bit about uh, coaching in, in the book um and i mainly talk about coaching as an impediment to progress uh it's uh, specifically the jump shot because the jump shot did become a common move in the game until the 1950s. Um, and that's because coaches basically said uh, that's a bad way to shoot it. It's less accurate. Um, you shouldn't shoot like that. And it took players to sort of smuggle it in and players who did have jump shots often got benched. Um, so the, 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 the approach that I took to coaching was something I think Naismith would uh endorsed, which was how are they uh, stopping progress, but how coaching has evolved is, is, is tremendous. I mean, now you have how much of it is managing egos versus actually coming up with, you know, plays and letting their, you know, versus letting the players do what they want. And I think the genius behind good coaches is, is knowing, um, knowing your team and being flexible and, and kind of being willing to, to, to adjust to, to their strengths. Um, Actually, I spoke a little bit with a, a, a chemist about that. Um, and, and she said, uh, she found, she always found it odd that people working well together was called uh, good chemistry because in her experience, it was always extremely messy and frustrating, um, which I thought was interesting. Um, but yeah, I think the ability to sort of change and grow and you look at the coaches who have been in the league the longest, someone like Greg Popovich on the, on the Spurs, his teams play completely different you know, now than they did in the nineties and cause he was willing to change along with the game and with his players. So, yeah, I think that's a important thing to think about. That's so wild. And something I never would have thought of is <laughs> how you adaptable as a coach. That's totally wild. Um, what did you, what did you read in preparation for this book? Um, and were, did you read any basketball memoirs and are there any ones that you Yes. Um, a big one for the early sections of the book is, is Naismith wrote with a lot of help um, a, a book uh, about his sort of invention of the game um, called Basketball, its origins and development, I believe it's called. It's a quick read and uh, the, it's actually kind of fun. The autobiographical stuff is, is interesting. Um, as far as uh, player memoirs, uh, there's one by Wilt Chamberlain called um, Wilt, uh, his first uh, autobiography. That is one of the I, I, one of the most entertaining books I've ever read in my entire life. Um, I don't know how much of it is true. He he certainly um, uh, was uh, prone to embellishment sometimes, but uh, it is uh, so funny uh, and entertaining and extremely ridiculous. Uh, so that's that's one that I I. I kind of uh, cherished and, and put a lot of that in, in one uh, specific chapter uh, where I, cause I, I couldn't resist writing about Wilt. Yeah, how could you not? Uh, Wilt Chamberlain prone to embellishment. Yeah, can you believe it? I'm breaking, <laughs> breaking news here. <laughs> I think I, uh -huh. I, oh, sorry. No, um, I was gonna people to enter questions in the chat but you should ask yours um i was just you know I, it's funny i as much as this is a question too when we're talking about like the management of personalities i was just thinking like so many of these um these kids have like grown up with such intense expectations and pressure on them um and you know whether it's for economic mobility um or it's like you know an inherited legacy um, it's, it's really, um, I think that's like a really interesting thing that a lot of people, um, don't think about when they watch, um, when they watch this game and like just how much work, um, these players have either put in or how much is at stake for them. Um, yeah. you know, and, and that's, that's something I think about a lot when I watch these games. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, the thought about making the NBA, I mean, you watch college basketball and you, there is, you can definitely see that this is, you know, the players are, are 
far worse than the pros. It's still obviously a huge popular sport, but there's the skill differences is, is major. And then you realize that if you ever met one of these college players in your life, they'd immediately be the best basketball player you've ever met. And just the kind of how rare it is to make it to the top level of the NBA and that these people are, you know, by far the best at this thing that so many people do. I mean, it's the second most played sport in the world. There's billions of people who have, who have shot a basketball. And so you have these few hundred who are the absolute most talented and, and best and had the sort of, you know, in some cases fortune, in some cases luck to sort of navigate the, the pathways to, to make it to the NBA. And it's, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty staggering and, and mind blowing and, and um, makes me dizzy to think about, especially as someone who's absolutely awful and terrible at basketball. <laughs> Do you, what do you see for the future of uh, NCAA um, and paying players or, I mean, is this, is that, yeah. is that ever going to happen? I mean, do you see that as like, I hope so. Um, and then you, you look, you know, I think it's the, the fact that the, the, the G league, which is sort of like the minor league in, in, in basketball players are now um, able to go there and, and make a, a paycheck rather than going to the NBA and then getting drafted from the G league itself, I think is like, is good because if the, if the college is not, I mean, the fact that, I mean, this is a billion, multi-billion dollar a year industry. Um, and, you know, I think it, I forget, it was Chris Weber saying that when he was at Michigan, you know, not getting paid and then going, walking through campus and seeing the school bookstore selling his jersey for 70 bucks. And he's not seeing a single penny of that. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's something's got to give. Uh, uh, and hopefully, uh, uh, hopefully soon we'll see yeah absolutely and I, I i know too that there's been a lot of talk too just about the disparity in like coaches and ownership um and like you know ev not just like money made but even just um the difference you know i mean the high percentage of people of color that are playing the game and then the high percentage of owners that are still like white men and that, that is kind of this legacy this has continued um coaches uh, too yeah yeah, 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 and and I'm I, I think more people are are at least that I know of uh, people are talking about it. Players are talking about it. Um, it feels like it's very much kind of this um, um, this thing that people aren't people aren't shying away from it right now, which I, I really appreciate. And I think it's like really important to think about, especially when we think about like who you know built the game and who's making it as popular as it is now and um, you know, where are those resources going? Who are getting, who's getting those jobs? I don't know. It, it feels like um, it's getting proper attention now, but there's, like you said, there's still so much work to be done. And I know that um, the players have done a lot of the work for that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and, you know, they, they, they're the ones who are affected by it and, and who, uh, who experience, you know, experience that, that those kinds of uh, um, disparities and everything. Uh, and so it's a thing that, that it, attention is, is I think probably the most important thing about it right now is, is uh, the fact that people are talking about it. Um, you know, if it makes the league a little uncomfortable, that's a good thing. Um, we have another question here uh, that says, do you discuss Bill Russell and the Celtics from his era? In this book? Bill Russell has, is a brief mention um, as a, mostly as a foil to Wilt Chamberlain. Um, Bill Russell is is uh, absolutely incredible and, and the the greatest winner the game has ever seen. The probably uh, most dominant defensive player ever. And um, when it comes to sort of breaking barriers and and uh, and um, you know and, and and kind of his uh, his 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 voice and his power as a as a um, you know, a voice for, for equality and, and for equal rights uh, at, a, you know, at, at such a fraught time uh, in history is, is also unparalleled at really in the game. Um, uh, so I, I do talk about him briefly. Uh, he's someone who um, deserves volumes of, of books. And, and uh, so sadly, mine, uh, mine is only sort of a, a br brief mention here and there, but um, I'll tell whoever asked that I was, I was thinking about Bill Russell very frequently while writing the book. <laughs> that probably creeps Bill Russell out if he knew that. <laughs> no, 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 Pro probably not. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know, maybe. 
Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, um, Green Apple Nick, do you have any other questions for Nick Green? Uh, I don't have. I no, I don't have any more questions. Um, I don't have any more questions. But I'm. I like could talk about basketball probably for the rest of my life. Um, yeah, it's. It, it's it's definitely fertile ground. Um, and it was, you know, writing the book was a really fun outlet. And I, I did so much of it during the pandemic. And so getting to just um, call random, smart, interesting people and talk to them about basketball, like we're doing right now was, um, it did more than just keep me sane. Uh, it was uh, a real joy. And um, I think if, if, uh, if any of that gets through in the book, I, um, I'd be very happy because it was a, a, a really wonderful experience. I mean, that definitely came through. And I mean, there's like a sense of humor and comedy. And um, one of my favorite parts of the book is when you were talking to the magicians. Yeah. Uh, Such a fantastic part in the book that uh, and felt kind of like, yeah. It was I'm so happy you mentioned that because that's Misdirections Magic Shop, which is across the street from Green Apple. Um, and uh, I actually, I popped in there to see um, Joe, the the owner and the sort of, um, you know, this, this uh, kind of a... Uh, Jedi master of a, a magician that people from around the world come to and to learn from him and, and to be able to talk to him about dribbling was was so cool. Um, and it's such a great store. And uh, I was I was happy that that was actually kind of, you know, the first real thing I wrote about, you know, in the book was talking to the magicians about dribbling. And that really got me off the ground running and Misdirections Magic Shop uh, holds a special place in my heart. It, it does hold a special place in our heart too, uh, at our, at our bookstore. Absolutely. Um, I, th I think the question that you were posed, like this, this question that you guys were kind of like rotating around or orbiting was like, what, what is magic? And, uh, you know, and that was kind of like the, at the root of, um, I, and it made me think about basketball, uh, through kind of like that, that lens and thinking about like the great, um, some of the greats like Chris Paul or these people who really yeah. are just like absolutely like spellbinding when you watch them and their handles or how they move. Uh, I mean, Kyrie Irving's another one where yeah. it does feel like magic to me. Um, I think I think there was a point that you were made. Well, like uh, he said something like he has 20 ways to make a coin disappear. And um, if you don't know, you know, to the viewer, the coin just disappeared. And to the magician, there are so many different ways. And like, that's magic is like- Yeah, uh, it was sort of, yeah. The question of being, is misdirection magic? I mean you someone like Kyrie Irving does misdirection all the time and why or why not is that why is that or why isn't is that not magic um and in speaking to to magicians about that it was it was fun and it was also a great excuse to just hang out in a magic shop <laughs> yeah absolutely um and I think I think that what they do you know I found myself like wanting to argue with the magicians uh about what magic <laughs> is, which I know it's not uh what i should be doing with any magician <laughs> um but i i couldn't help it because to me like what, what these what these players are doing is is magic to me it is beyond my capability yeah i mean to understand um it is it is involved with so many of these unseen forces like physics like we, i mean and you pull so much of this into your book um uh, it's like physics or or embodiment or um all these things and um to me that does kind of exist in this this kind of like uh, fantastic um, plane of like dreams. I mean, even you were talking about dunking and how you wanted to dunk so bad. And like, how it was like, almost feels like, you know, this thing you would dream about. I mean, that's kind of what this feels like to me sometimes when I watch these games is like this, yeah. this kind of like extra planar place or yeah, it's, it's really- Yeah, it's, I, it's, it's, you know, back to the feeling of, of being lucky. I do feel lucky to, to be able to, especially during the season, just turn on a basketball game. It's, it's a great way to um, uh, kind of uh, um, massage my brain and lull myself into a nice little form of hypnosis. We do have one more question here before we wrap up. Someone asks, how do you define basketball IQ? Oh, that's a fantastic uh, question. Um, I personally um, define it as intuition, um, sort of uh, 
both spatial intuition of knowing where to be on the court and where things are happening, um, intuition for the flow of the game, um, kind of interpret these patterns um, that that exist on the court and, and, and kind of make your decisions based on that. Um, and uh, you also obviously the ability to sort of act upon those hunches and, and intuitions. But if you watch someone like LeBron James, who you'll frequently hear described as having the best, highest basketball IQ, you know, of anyone, um, of, of someone who basically knows where not only he's going to be, but where his teammates are going to be, and where the opponents are going to be. I think that's a, a pretty, albeit basic, but um, a definition that I, I, I would rely on. That's fantastic. It's like, I'm, I'm so glad to hear you both talk about it because you're, um, I'm a novice and it's not my game, but it's something that I have a massive amount of respect for, which I think is, you know, it, it's not just a meathead sport kind of thing. And I think that's the whole point of your book. And so it, it really is magic and it's a magic of physicality and so impressive. It's so impressive. Um, I'm so glad you have a chapter about ballet in there because I, I think that comparison is pretty remarkable. Um, yeah. Uh, I want to thank you both for joining us this evening and thank, thank you, you out there uh, in, in, the, in the internet sphere um, from across the country for joining us as well. Um, I would be remiss in my duty if I didn't remind you that <laughs> oh, we have signed copies of Nick Green's book available for purchase for you um, in person at Green Apple at any of our locations or online um, to have shipped to you. Um, thank you both again so much. It was a real treat. Thank you. And uh, yeah, absolutely. You guys should read this book. I mean, I think you're gonna have a lot of fun reading this book. I think it's gonna be really interesting. I think it's gonna make you feel um, smarter when it comes to basketball. I think it's gonna be interesting. I think it's gonna make you see the game differently. I really, I really anybody who, who loves basketball should be by read this book, absolutely. Yeah, it was a pleasure to read. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you both.